What's up everybody? Welcome back. Tonight we're going to do a little crash course on drive shafts, uh, how to measure for a drive shaft, uh, what kind of material you need for your drive shaft, uh, some of the important things that go into building a drive shaft for a drag racing application. Uh, there's a lot to unpack with drive shafts, so we're just going to be looking at the rear drive shaft tonight. So if you're a two-wheel drive or a four-wheel drive, we're just going to look at the rear drive shaft tonight. So before we jump into what kind of materials uh, and links and stuff like that, uh, the first place you need to start with the drive shaft is knowing a couple of things about what you have and being able to measure for it. So the first thing you're going to need to know is what kind of yoke you have on your rear axle. Uh, and you'll need to know the dimensions of the inside of the cap area, uh, and you'll need to know the uh, dimensions of the inside of the cap, the, the diameter of the cap. This here is a 1350 U-joint. Uh, and a 1350 U-joint, they all measure out pretty standard. So if you know the size of U-joint that you're running, <clears throat> you don't really need those measurements, but some drive shaft shops might require them. Uh, and then now on the transmission or the transfer case side, if you don't already have a yoke, you're going to need to know the spline count and the diameter of the output shaft in the transmission or the transfer case. If you already have a yoke, uh, then you don't need to worry about that. You can just send the yoke to the drive shaft company. Now, as far as measuring for a drive shaft goes, that's going to depend on Every drive shaft company, it seems like they're a little bit different on how they want you to do it. If you already have a yoke, then I can show you how to measure for the running length. And running length is basically how it's going to be in the vehicle. <clears throat> so, assuming that this is your transmission or transfer case output shaft here, this is the yoke on the rear end housing, and then this is the yoke that your drive shaft will have. Basically, what you want to do is you want to slide that yoke in and you'll want to take it all the way in until it bottoms out and then you're going to want to pull it back out uh, about one inch is a pretty good safe bet it's a good rule of thumb so pull that thing back out from bottoming out one inch and then now you can take a tape measure and you can measure from the center of this u-joint to the flat on the yoke on the rear end housing the flat of the yoke on the rear end housing is going to be the center of that u-joint so anytime we're talking U-joint measurements, we're talking center to center. Now it's important that you have your car or truck at ride height. Uh, if you have the suspension hanging, or if you have uh, you know, a bunch of separation or something, it's going to change the, that measurement. So it's very important that that measurement is made at ride height to get the correct amount of slip on this yoke here. Now if you don't have a yoke and you need to order uh, drive shaft and have them supply the yoke for you. There's two measurements on the transmission or transfer case side that they're going to need. They're going to need to know the distance from the output shaft to the flat flange on the yoke. So that's going to give them the rear end housing yoke, the center of the U-joint. It's going to give them that measurement to this output shaft here. And then they're going to need to know how much this output shaft protrudes from the transmission. So you'll need to measure the protrusion of the output shaft and then give them those two numbers. With those two bits of information, they'll be able to build you a drive shaft and supply the yoke and then they'll build it to the correct running length. Okay, so now that we know how to measure for the drive shaft, what kind of drive shaft do we need? And that is going to depend on application. Uh, if you're watching my channel here, you're probably a diesel racer, but all of this information applies to any racing of any sort. Uh, tube diameter, the type of material, and the length of it are all going to factor into how much torque the shaft can take and the critical speed of the shaft. Critical speed is very important. Uh, that is basically the speed in which the drive shaft turns into a jump rope, so uh, you don't want that. Uh, the easiest way to calculate that is with a Wallace Racing Calculator. If you just go on Google and Google Wallace Racing Calculators, they have a critical speed calculator. And you'll need those measurements that we just taught how to measure. Uh, and basically, you'll need to know the tube length. And then you'll need to know uh, the diameter of the tube 
And the nice thing about those calculators are is you can play around with it. You can plug in a couple different tube diameters and wall thicknesses uh, to see what your critical speed is. But whatever number that spits out, uh, for example, a 57 inch, four inch aluminum drive shaft uh, is good to about 6,300 drive shaft RPM. That is the critical speed of that shaft. Uh, at 60, 358 or whatever you know that's when the shaft uh, can fail so then you need to know how much drive shaft rpm you're running i know that we personally have been 165 miles an hour on a four inch aluminum tube uh, the drive shaft rpm on that was somewhere just north of 5000 rpm and so we were uh, still well within spec so usually depending on how fast you're going uh this stuff isn't extremely critical for the lower end stuff, but the faster you go, the more that you need to pay attention to this. And of course, because uh, we are racing vehicles that are heavy and make a lot of torque, the diameter of the tube and the material of the tube matter a lot. Uh, a steel tube is going to be stronger than an aluminum tube. I don't like to use steel tubes because they're heavy. Uh, the heavier tube even though it is stronger and the critical speed will be higher because of that, uh, the critical speed is also <laughs> suffers slightly because of the added weight of the tube. Um, but really mainly for me, I don't. I like to keep a drive line as light as possible. And uh, if you can get away with uh, aluminum, that's the way I like to go. Uh, four inch aluminum shaft, like I said, we have been very fast with 165 miles an hour. Uh, we've been 117, 60 foot at sub 4,000 pounds. Uh, in my particular truck behind me, I've been 138 miles an hour with that shaft, and I've been 135, 60 foot at 4,800 pounds. I think there's plenty left on the table, but dealing with a good drive shaft shop and using the calculator is going to give you guys a better idea of exactly what you need for your setup. Uh, and we're specifically talking about one piece drive shafts here. Uh, any of the drag racing stuff really should be one piece. Uh, there's really no reason for it to be two piece until you get into crazy long spans. Uh, and you know, some of you guys are racing four door long bed trucks, uh, but even then, there's several other options for a one piece shaft. Uh, and that's kind of where the materials start to factor into it a little bit more as well. At some point, you get too long of a span and you have to make a decision. You either have to change material type or you have to go larger in diameter. So say if you have a uh, 70 inch drive shaft, uh, well that is going to have a lot lower critical speed and it's going to have a lot lower uh, torque yield than the 57 inch 4 inch aluminum drive shaft. So you're either going to have to go to a material that can handle uh, the longer length or you need to go larger in diameter. So a uh, five inch aluminum shaft uh, would be good in that scenario. And then really this is where a carbon drive shaft comes into play. Uh, carbon drive shafts are really expensive. <clears throat> I'm not a fan of them because of the price of them, but there are certain situations or certain links and certain applications to where the carbon shaft is a necessity. Really the only reason for a carbon shaft, aside from the safety of the carbon itself, uh, if a carbon shaft is to fail, it basically uh, splinters and it doesn't usually create a bunch of catastrophic damage, although I have seen where it still can, uh, but typically it's a, it's a safer, cleaner failure, uh, if you will. But the main purpose of it is, is for a critical speed. You have a drive shaft that's a certain length, you're running it at a certain uh, drive shaft RPM, and that requires a certain critical speed. So this is where you're gonna have to lean on those calculators and ultimately you're gonna have to lean on a good drive shaft shop uh, to go over all these numbers with you and figure out if you have something that's in a really weird situation like that. But for the most part, everything that I've seen in the 4x4 diesel truck world, uh, especially at the levels that we're operating at, aside from you know maybe a handful of people that are going really fast, like Derek Rose, 180 miles an hour in the eighth. Uh, a four inch aluminum tube drive shaft, something around 110, uh, I, I, not even 125 thousandths, like the stuff that we've run was 110, 
uh, wall tube size, but you could go to 125 wall tube, uh, is going to be, in my opinion, pretty much sufficient. Now, like I said, make sure to lean on your drive shaft shop. Those guys are going to know more than anybody. Uh, and lean on those calculators to make sure that the critical speed and the torque is working good. But for a rear drive shaft, that's 100% going to be my go to. So now let's talk about drive shaft angle uh, because drive shaft angle matters with your U joint size. U joint size matters with horsepower. Uh, they're kind of all tied together. So I made a little illustration here to make it a little bit easier to explain this. Okay, so basically you have your engine, which is your crank, your transmission, your drive shaft, and your rear end. And these are all on a plane, right? The transmission and the crank is on the same plane because they're bolted together. And then the rear end housing is on an independent plane because you can change the ride height, change the tire size. That's going to change where the pinion of the rear end is. And then uh, your drive shaft angle would be the third variable in that. Ideally, you want your from the front of the crank to the pinion to be on the same plane. So if your engine has five degrees of angle back, like this one does, uh, like my particular truck does, then your transmission needs to have five degrees of that same angle back. So that way you can get your drive shaft perfectly straight, perfectly in line with the transmission output shaft and the crankshaft. This, along with getting the drive shaft as straight with the transmission and the crank from side to side, is going to yield you the best results uh, for U joint wear. It is not going to take any extra horsepower to turn any of this stuff because it's in a bind, and it's going to give your drive shaft uh, the most optimal chance of living and surviving the most abuse. There's definitely free horsepower in uh, those U-joint angles. Keeping the U-joints straight and as least amount of stress on them as possible is free horsepower and free energy that you can transfer to the rest of the chassis on top of the best chance of not having any driveline vibration at the same time. So we'll talk about U-joint size uh, just a little bit. Uh, pretty much your two big common drag racing U-joint sizes are going to be a 1350 or a 1480. Uh, a 1480 is like extreme duty stuff. If you have a really high horsepower two-wheel drive vehicle, uh, say you have a, a two-wheel drive diesel truck that's really fast, something, you know, four seconds and faster, uh, the 1480 might not be a bad idea uh, because at some point the 1350 just becomes a wear item there's only so much torque and power that that thing can take and because you're putting it all through two u-joints because you don't have a transfer case splitting any of the load you're asking more of those u-joints uh, and in that application i would probably step up to a 1480. in any other application so anything that's uh, maybe a little bit less power a little bit slower uh, or four-wheel drive the 1350 U-joint size is more than sufficient. Uh, when we get into the next video where I talk about front drive shaft stuff, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about 1350 U-joints and some concerns there. But on a rear drive shaft, on anything, uh, you know, decent horsepower and pretty fast and anything four-wheel drive, uh, you can totally, absolutely, 100% get away with a 1350 U-joint. So that's pretty much all I got for this one, guys. Just wanted to take a few minutes here tonight uh, since I was doing some drive shaft stuff myself and go over some of the key factors that go into choosing the right drive shaft. Uh, as far as companies that you can deal with, uh, I've dealt with several different drive shaft companies. I've dealt with uh, Inland Empire drive shaft out of California. I've dealt with the drive shaft pros. Uh, out of California. Uh, I've dealt with a local drive shaft shop, uh, uh, Cincy Driveline. Uh, and you know, all three of those guys have been nothing but good to me for what I needed. Uh, when you get into the carbon stuff, that's where you're going to have to get some specific, uh, like the Inland Company does it, the Drive Shaft Pro does it, my local shop doesn't touch anything carbon. Uh, PST 
is one of probably the biggest names in carbon drive shafts. Uh, so if you're if you think that you're in that carbon drive shaft arena and that's what you need to go with, uh, you know, doing some research and calling some of those companies would would definitely be important. But really, any good drive shaft shop honestly can uh, accomplish what you need to accomplish for you know most power level vehicles. So. That's all I got for this one, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you're interested in four-wheel drive drive shaft stuff, on the next video, uh, probably tomorrow or the next day, we will talk specifically about the front drive shaft. And uh, there's probably just as much to unpack with that as there is in this video. So stay tuned for that one. If you're new here, click the subscribe button. Hit that like button. It helps me get the video out there to more people. And like always, guys, we'll see you next time.